Um, so have, have a look there when, when you have a time, when you have some time. So welcome to this session uh, in the Blue Economy Track, um, of, you know, the Island uh, Finance Forum on kind of building a uh, blue future, harnessing the hope of, uh, of the ocean. So it's a really um, important topic, um, you know, looking at, you know, integrating the blue economy into, you know, the, the wider, um, you know, opportunities that countries have. And then one thing that I have learned uh, over the years covering the ocean economy, um, you know, is that small island states are really big ocean states, um, given how they depend on the ocean, but also how they harness the vast economic opportunities um, and, you know, that, that, that the ocean offers. And of course, for island communities, the ocean's resources and opportunities are you know, crucial in ensuring food security, creating jobs, boosting economic development. You know, at the same time, these communities are preserving and supporting the health and integrity of the ocean, while also harnessing the ocean's ability to promote human well-being. So it's it's really um, it's a really uh, a great opportunity to talk about you know these these the, you know what the ocean economy has to offer, but also the challenges of harnessing its opportunities. And you know, for many of these big ocean states, the largest sector is often tourism, which calls for kind of pristine beaches, vibrant corals, lots of marine life in order to attract, you know, these high income foreign travelers. But there's also, of course, another important sector uh, that, that many of these economies have, which is fisheries, relying on, you know, thriving population of fish to kind of sustain these local communities, and of course, also generate uh, exports. And, you know, keeping these sectors and the wider economy afloat is a major challenge, and not least amid a global pandemic, uh, but also a global climate crisis, as we know, and, and the financial constraints of many of these economies. So in these challenging circumstances, you know, many of, of these island uh, nations, um, you know, they, uh, or big ocean states, uh, are, are turning to innovation and, uh, you know, at the World Ocean Initiative, and, you know, have a, have a look uh, at our website, you know, there, we look at a lot of examples of you know what is what is happening in those countries and we've recently um, highlighted the example of the seychelles and i know we have speakers as well that that can can talk about um about of the, this particular uh, island nation or big ocean state but also um you know we look at others but you know with the help of foreign partners the country has piloted two creative financial approaches a debt for uh, nature swap and a, a, na a sovereign blue bond to ease the debt burn and raise you know funds for conservation climate adaptation and also the transition to a sustainable fisheries. So have a look at, uh, at that case study uh, through a blog that um, Angelique uh, Poupano and uh, uh, Katie Slater uh, wrote on our website. I'm going to just paste it here in the in the chat as well. So have, have a look at that. And we have many more examples on our website to look at kind of these, these case studies of innovative blue finance. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we actually have, a, as I mentioned, we have a blue finance a, a lever as well on our website where we cover these kind of blue finance topics. Uh, I'm just going to post it in the, in the chat. And of course, the sustainable ocean economy, the particular challenges and opportunities of island nations will also be explored in depth du during, our, uh, during our World Ocean Summit. And of course, this, the uh, Island Innovation Series is also a great way of kind of connecting the global ocean community. And as you know, the World Ocean Summit is uh, is the largest uh, global ocean event that brings together these kind of different communities. We're going to be in person in Lisbon uh, next year, so I'm just posting the details here. Um, so that we know, despite all these opportunities that the ocean offers, you know, of all the SDGs, we know that SDG 14, the one on life below water, has attracted the lowest levels of investment. And that's such a missed opportunity given the ocean's importance in areas such as climate action, food security, sustainable consumption, so today, let's hear from ocean leaders from island nations about how they are building a blue future and how they're harnessing the hope of the ocean. So following the open, uh, opening keynote by His Excellency Surangel Whips Jr., the President of the Republic of Palau, I will be excited to moderate a discussion with three excellent speakers. So we have Jean-Paul Adam, the Director of the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for Africa. We have Melissa Walsh, she's Program Manager, Ocean Finance Initiative at the Asian Development Bank. And last but not least, we have Dr. Trans from Akorao. He's professor and director of the Institute of Ocean Islands and Sustainable Development. So you can also participate uh, in the Q&A later in this session. Please state your name, organization, and where you are joining from when submitting a question. Please submit comments to all panelists and attendees in the drop-down box that is uh, it's automatically defaults to all panelists in Zoom. So make sure it's uh, to all panelists and attendees. But first, let's hear from His Excellency, 
Surangel Whips Jr., the President of the Republic of Palau. And warm greetings, Excellencies, distinguished leaders, honored guests, and everyone joining us from around the world. The climate ocean crisis poses a unique case for small island developing states and coastal communities whose economic and social well-being depends on the ocean. SIDS are always faced with the challenge of balancing production and protection with the ultimate goal to benefit the people, our most valuable resource. The COVID-19 pandemic caused a complete shutdown of our visitor industry, which resulted in the evaporation of a third of our GDP and employment and drove us deeper into debt. This coupled with the devastation caused by storms, sea level rise, coral bleaching, and the reduction in fish stocks has limited our ability to achieve our sustainable development goals. And in fact, caused us to regress. These major government shortfalls continue to impact education, public safety, healthcare, and other vital public services. Excellencies and distinguished leaders, where there is threat, there are opportunities for achieving sustainable development. But SIDS countries cannot do it alone. We need an infusion of innovative financing, new ideas, and fresh partnerships to help us build resilience at all levels. During the recent Our Ocean Conference held in Palau just a few days ago, Palau had the opportunity of hosting more than 80 countries and 200 non-state actors to reflect on the realities of the health of our ocean and the impacts of climate change that SIDS face. More importantly, it was a conference about making commitments and taking action. Palau committed to achieve 100% sustainable management of our ocean from the shoreline to our maritime boundaries by 2025. Palau also launched its Blue Prosperity Plan, an innovative approach to achieve a sustainable ocean-based economy. The plan addressed three critical areas, replacement of lost government revenue, utilization of science and traditional knowledge in marine spatial planning to protect the most vulnerable areas and to develop a domestic fishery. Palau also committed to transition to 100% renewable energy by 2032, which frees Palau from being hostage to fossil fuels, thus lowering the cost of utilities while simultaneously mitigating the impact of climate change. The impacts of investing in su the sustainability sector on islands which include sustainable fisheries, renewable energy, reduction in energy use, and eco-friendly transit options will result in a more resilient and secure communities. Environmental Social Governance, ESG investing, is an important strategy for putting your money to work with the public and private sectors to offer socioeconomic opportunities for everyone, especially the most vulnerable populations of the world. This inclusive approach serves all stakeholders, workers, indigenous peoples and communities, consumers, shareholders, and the environment. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity to join together for a win-win. We have to take bold steps to coordinate and harness solutions that protect our natural environment and deliver us a triple bottom line for our planet, our people, and our prosperity. Thank you. Thank you so much to His Excellency uh, Surangel Whips Jr., President of the Republic of Palau, you know, for highlighting you know, the importance of the ocean economy for his, his country. I mean, it, one, one really important uh, statement he, he made there is that uh, you know, where there are threats, there are opportunities. And, and he highlighted very powerfully you know, that there is, there is that opportunity if, you know, if we you know, come up with those innovative financing solutions, you know, to create these fresh partnerships to build resilience. And he mentioned the Blue Prosperity Plan. And, 
uh, you know, about, you know, sustainably managing uh, the ocean economy, looking at, you know, science, uh, looking at ocean spatial planning uh, and taking bold steps. So there's, there's a lot of encouragement uh, there. Um, let's hear uh, from, from our panelists as well in terms of, you know, their experience of, you know, building a, a sustainable ocean economy and, uh, and the role of blue finance. So I'd now like to ask our first panelist to take the floor, Jean-Paul Adam, the director at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Jean-Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to join you once again and to speak um, after such a, a distinguished orator as the president of, of Palau. So I will start by firstly outlining the importance of the ocean uh, in uh, island economies. Uh, islands are the ones that are feeling the brunt of climate change and the ocean is the first line of defense. It's through the ocean that we will see the largest impacts in terms of climate change. Um, a number of uh, small island states are already seeing the impacts of rising sea levels. And it's also the means by which we're turning to the oceans to be able to actually respond to climate change and build climate resilience. Building on my own personal experience, I've one of the aspects that always, um, it, it's, it's one of the things that bothers me the most, but also inspires me to action is that when I was a young boy, uh, the reefs that I swam on, I remember them as extremely vibrant, as uh, being full of color. And the problem that my daughters face is that they may never see those reefs in the same state again, because we've had several bleaching events in the Seychelles Islands where I'm from uh, since in the, in the last 30 years, which have dramatically affected uh, the capacity of these reefs uh, to regenerate themselves. And going forward, they will not be able to regenerate themselves if we have the increasing acceleration uh, in warming events. But the ocean itself is a means by which we can respond uh, to these threats. In countries such as Seychelles, we've tended to look at the blue economy as a strategy to address these issues, to both be able to grow our economies sustainably uh, and simultaneously provide that level of resilience and protection that is required uh, to face the threat of climate change. We obviously are in a current situation where we are facing unparalleled levels of disruption to the global economy. Uh, we have the challenge of uh, COVID-19, which most countries are only still just emerging from. We have the uh, war in Ukraine, which unfortunately has created global levels of shocks. And island countries are always the first to feel these shocks and often to feel them more uh, dramatically, particularly due to their dependence on tourism, uh, for example. But in, being able to build this resilience through a blue economy is about having a, uh, an economy which is more resistant to shocks. There are, the blue economy is necessarily very wide ranging and covering so many areas, but I will focus very briefly on only three of those sectors. Firstly, sustainable fisheries, uh, this is very much the, uh, a question of tradition in many countries. It's a question of uh, livelihoods and of uh, um, the linkage between the resources that are intrinsically part of communities. But they are also, in many cases, the main source of foreign exchange. And there is this constant balance between the needs of artisanal uh, fisheries and the need to also work with industrial uh, fishing uh, companies. Um, some countries have quite successfully uh, managed to develop quotas that support uh, local uh, fisher, uh, fisheries entrepreneurs uh, and also ensure that there is a flow of finance, a flow of resources that is guaranteed uh, for these local communities. Uh, but there is this constant threat in terms of the global need for fisheries and illegal fishing is also increasingly uh, a challenge. To be able to address this, we need fishing strategies that are actually built around local communities and which recognize that uh, if we are investing properly in these local communities, we're actually taking the first step towards building uh, sustainable fisheries in the long term. This also means where industrial fisheries are active, that there has to be full transparency around these fisheries. And I would urge all countries to consider joining the Fisheries Transparency Initiative, which is modeled on the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which aims to bring this accountability to large-scale uh, fisheries. 
And we have to look directly at the linkage between sustainable fisheries and responding to climate because a sustainable uh, fisheries resource is one of the keys to having sustainable reefs and being able to, in the long term, respond uh, to climate change. The second area is around marine protected areas and marine based ecotourism. Many uh, island countries, the majority, are already depending on these elements as a, a cornerstone of their tourism strategies. Uh, marine protected areas actually bring huge benefits and a recent World Bank uh, report has shown the protected areas in general, including marine protected areas, can br bring return on investment of up to six times the initial investment. A lot of the challenges are, however, that these marine protected areas may impinge or be seen to impinge on the rights of, for example, traditional fisheries. And it's very important that marine protected areas are designed with multiple uses in mind, uh, but keeping in, 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 uh, in focus the importance of being able to uh, uh, create uh, marine protected areas which facilitate the regeneration of extremely uh, sensitive uh, areas. Uh, the, uh, an effective blue economy strategy must also look at the issue of safe, efficient and clean uh, maritime transport. Uh, maritime transport are the arteries that allow trade to go ahead. And in the context of Africa, we're seeing that the implementation of the African continental free, uh, free trade area will necessitate at least an additional 100 large scale container vessels uh, that would ply the routes across Africa, as well as additional bulk, bulk transfer, transportation vessels and uh, vessels that will also be involved in the transportation of fuel. And we've all seen the risk that this brings through the tragic incident uh, that occurred in Mauritius in, in 2020. We have to be able to ensure that uh, maritime transport um, is uh, able to go ahead because these are the arteries that allow uh, trade to go, go ahead at a global level, but that it happens in a way which does not uh, create further risks uh, for, the, the, uh, for the ocean, uh, in particular in its, uh, in its role as the first line of climate resilience. So to conclude my, my remarks, looking at these three areas, for example, we need to look at how we're going to finance additional investments. And Martin pointed out that uh, the ocean has actually had some of the least investment uh, globally, and that's for many different reasons, partly because most of, quite often, uh, oceans uh, are uh, managed by small island developing states. These are often seen as areas that are risky to invest in. Uh, and also there's been less capacity to, to harness other types of financing such as through the Blue Green Climate Fund. So there's a need to look at innovations and debt for climate adaptation swaps are among those innovations that have to be addressed, not only by island states, but also by the rising tide of debt, which will put at risk our ability to achieve climate objectives. In Africa alone, African countries as an average will be paying 7% of GDP in debt repayments in 2022. If we don't uh, find a, a mechanism to deal with these uh, debts, we will be facing uh, another macroeconomic crisis. Uh, debt for climate adaptation swaps are a means of repurposing existing debt to create flows of investment that are directly linked uh, to investment in climate adaptation. In the context of Seychelles, it was for the creation of one of the largest, the second largest marine protected area in the Indian Ocean. The opportunity is there as well for blue bond financing, where we can create uh, uh, vehicles uh, which uh, can be invested in by equity partners across the world uh, in investing in uh, vehicles that can provide on lending, for example, to small and medium enterprises. These enterprises could be in the fisheries sector, as was the case in the Seychelles, uh, where you're looking and you, you're looking to uh, support those fishery, fisheries investors that are trying to improve the value chain by, for example, investing in, uh, in the cold chain, increasing value addition, and therefore getting more value from the resource. Also, I think there's an opportunity to look at emerging sectors, and certainly uh, globally, we we're seeing, for example, a fertilizer crisis, and there is increasing evidence that shows that uh, seaweed is, is one of the ingredients that could be used to revolutionize uh, the availability of fertilizer, as an example. Uh, all of this can be financed by the private sector through blue bonds, but you need those guarantees and credit enhancements that can allow them to be affordable for the most vulnerable countries. And the final point that I will emphasize is the opportunity to access carbon credit markets, where we know that 
uh, seagrass, for example, seagrass and mangroves are shown to be uh, about twice to three times more effective in absorbing greenhouse gases than tropical rainforests. So if we are able to properly access uh, carbon credit markets and we are able to certify carbon credits, and particularly th there's the issue of capacity in small island developing states, but providing that support would be a means of getting additional revenue that can be invested in climate resilience. This is one of the areas that the United Nations Economic Mission for Africa is developing uh, for the support of all African countries, not only its, its small island developing states, but we think that this is one of the frontiers that has to be explored if we're going to truly mobilize resources uh, that can be invested in climate resilience and create this virtuous circle, which is what the blue economy is all about. It's about investing in resilience and at the same time creating new avenues for sustainable livelihoods. Thank you, Martin, and back to you. Amazing. Thanks so much, Jean-Paul. That, that was really uh, fascinating here. And you mentioned, you know, building resilience through the blue economy is, is possible. You, have, uh, you know, mentioned some great examples there in terms of, you know, how that can be done through sustainable fisheries, marine protected areas, you know, how to build kind of marine-based ecotourism. And you also mentioned the importance of safe, efficient, clean marine transport. And of course, you know, the financing instruments you mentioned, the debt for climate adaptation swaps, the blue bond financing and the uh, voluntary carbon credit markets are absolutely crucial. And, uh, and, and, you know, as we said earlier, you were actually, you know, played a pivotal role in the Seychelles. Uh, that's what I'm just going to, um, you know, post the, the case study here again that I mentioned earlier that we have on the World Ocean Initiative highlighting what, what the Seychelles did. So um, thanks again, Jean-Paul. Jean so now I'd like to, um, you know, ask uh, our next speaker uh, uh, to take the floor, Melissa Walsh, uh, Program Manager, Ocean Finance Initiative at the Asian Development Bank. Um, Melissa. Thank you, Martin. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I wanna start by paying respect to the Gambangir people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm calling from today. And while I'm in Australia now, I've spent most of my life and career in the Pacific Islands. And so I wanted to start with one of my favorite quotes about the region that, uh, that I'm working in. And this is from Professor Ipeli Haofa, a Pacific Island writer and anthropologist. And I think he best described the region when he said, we should not be defined by the smallness of our islands, but the greatness of our oceans. In other words, the ocean is paramount to everything in the Blue Pacific continent. And I would posit that this extends to much of Southeast Asia as well. Um, I noted from the initial poll that about 36% of audience members are calling in from Asia Pacific. So you know this as well as I do, that almost every economic opportunity in the region is related to the ocean, whether it's fisheries, aquaculture, transport, or tourism. Uh, as the epicenter of mo both marine biodiversity, but also a global hotspot for many human threats, such as marine plastic pollution, what's happening in the islands of Asia Pacific affects the rest of the world. And to take that a step further, the blue economy is a large portion of what's happening in these island nations. For example, the blue economy contributes as much as 19% of the GDP in Vietnam. But in the Pacific region, this can be even higher. Revenues from fishing fees can contribute for up to 90% of domestic resource mobilization for some Pacific Island nations. Furthermore, the blue economy is expected to grow faster than the general global economy, with rates of growth of approximately 10% in some blue economy sectors. So at ADB, we define the blue economy to include all sectors that support ocean health and resilience. Um, as President Whips so eloquently put it, it's that balancing of production and protection for the prosperity of island people. And this includes a spectrum of activities. On one hand, we're working to mainstream ocean health into traditional development sectors. So for example, supporting green ports and decarbonization of shipping. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we're working to support these emerging nascent blue economy sectors, what we term ocean positive subsectors, such as sustainable aquaculture and seaweeds and marine renewable energy like floating solar. Um, and we recognize that these investments, whether it's on the mainstreaming side or growing ocean positive small and medium enterprises, they're all necessary to strengthen the resilience, protect cultural heritage, 
and catalyze a blue, a blue recovery in island nations. So uh, opportunities to invest in the blue economy are definitely growing. A high level panel um, paper found that sustainable ocean investments could produce 15.5 trillion in net benefits by 2050. It, these are really large numbers. Um, so take clean energy, for example, offshore wind can generate 23 times more power than present total global electricity consumption. So the opportunities are really, really big. But um, so far I've talked on a very theoretical basis. And so I wanna make that more tangible because I'm sure members of the audience are wondering, what can I do on a practical and tangible level? So I'm gonna give you a very brief overview of what we're doing in the ADB Healthy Oceans Program and then give you three specific opportunities. In 2019, ADB launched a Healthy Ocean Action Plan together with a commitment to leverage up to 5 billion for ocean health by 2024. And I'm really proud to share with you that we're making good progress so far. We're tracking at 4.6 billion. And our Healthy Ocean Program has four flagship areas, coastal resilience and nature-based solutions, marine plastic pollution, sustainable seafood, and ocean finance. So the three opportunities I'm gonna to talk to you about today are within our ocean finance initiative. Okay, the first is to access blue economy funding through our new finance facilities. You'll see in the chat, I've put a bunch of links, which Zoom has merged together into one, uh, but I can send those to you separately as well about these opportunities. In the last few months, we launched two new finance facilities, the Blue Sea or Southeast Asia, Finance Hub is based in Indonesia, and it is a blended finance facility targeting 300 million in bankable ocean investments by 2024. And the SME Blue Impact Asia platform works across the Asia Pacific region, and it's supporting emerging small and medium ocean enterprises. We are also proud to announce that we are now developing a Blue Pacific Finance Hub, building on our work in Southeast Asia. This hub aims to grow to raise 50 million in grant finance to leverage 500 million in ocean investments across the Pacific. We really feel strongly that grant funding is needed for Pacific Island nations to strengthen enabling conditions and to originate and prepare projects and also to provide project implementation grants for projects that are not yet ready to be bankable or go for loan or debt finance. So that's the first opportunity. The second is around blue bonds. And um, a minute ago, Jean-Paul was talking about a debt for nature swap type of blue bond. We are developing a, another tool in that toolbox, another type of blue bond. And earlier this month um, at our ocean conference in Palau, ADB launched a blue bond incubator. So simply put, um, the type of blue bond that I'm referring to is a package of loans that are used to fund ocean projects. And together as a package, the projects can attract new investors to grow the blue economy. We launched our own blue bond last September and we designed it to be replicable and scalable. And so now through the new blue bond incubator, we will be providing technical assistance and grants to support countries and companies to develop and issue their own blue bonds. So we hope that um, our island nations in the audience today will consider if and how this opportunity um, is something you would like to discuss further. And the third opportunity is around specifically for atoll nations. ADB recognizes the extent and the immediacy of climate change crisis facing atoll nations. Uh, it's a really unique situation and we understand that we need to accelerate our support to prepare for and mitigate these extreme impacts. For atoll nations, climate adaptation is a key component of the blue economy. I don't think it can be separated. And in fact, Investments in atoll nations will be key to achieving ADB's ambitious climate commitment of 100 billion in cumulative climate financing by 2030. It, so ADB is empowering atoll nations through the coalition of atoll nations on climate change. And some of the types of assistance that we hope to offer 
are to support con convening regional knowledge sharing events, um, peer to peer learning and policy dialogues, but also to support um, members of these atoll nations to participate in global dialogues and amplify your messages on the world stage to talk about the disproportionate impacts of climate change and the ways in which investments can be used for climate and ocean outcomes. In closing, I wanted to thank the organizers um, of this Island Finance Forum for bringing the spotlight to these urgent needs to build blue economies for island nations. Thanks to my esteemed panelists, it's a great honor to speak next to you tonight. And lastly, a call to action for everyone in the audience. I think collectively we have a lot of work to do, particularly to bring island nations um, into this blue economy global dialogue, but I know that together we can do it and I look forward to building those partnerships with you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Melissa. That, that's that been amazing. And you highlighted how important, um, you know, the ocean economy is in many of, of you know, the island uh, nations or big ocean states. You know, you mentioned, you know, the 90 percent of GDP often, you know, comes uh, in, in many of those countries comes from, you know, fisheries, for example. But there's even more of the economy in terms of domestic resource mobilization. It depends on these economies. You also highlighted the um, you know, the, 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 the whole spectrum of opportunities from green ports to um, new opportunities for like, aquaculture and so on. And, uh, but also you highlighted, you know, the work that you're doing at ADB in terms of the Healthy Ocean Action Plan. I think you shared a couple of links in the, in the chat. You mentioned the Blue Bond Incubator, the Blue Pacific Finance Hub. You mentioned the Coalition for Atoll Nations and Climate Change. So lo lots of uh, food for thought, lots of great resources. I'm going to just add another resource in the chat there, which is our uh, links to all of the kind of blue finance work we're doing at the World Ocean Initiative, where we summarize many of those developments as well that, that you mentioned, uh, Melissa. So that, that, that's great. I also wanted to remind everyone, uh, you know, to all attendees that you can participate in the Q&A. I can see there are already a couple of questions that have come through. So please state your name, your organization, where you're joining from when submitting a question. Please also submit uh, comments to all panelists and attendees in the drop down box because, you know, automatically uh, defaults to all panelists in Zoom. So we're looking forward to receiving your, your questions. Um, so I would like, you know, now I'd like to ask our final panelist to take the floor before we go into the Q and A. Uh, Dr. Transform uh, Akorao, he's the professor and director of the Institute of Ocean Islands and Sustainable Development. Transform. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to present. I I want to talk about my previous experience in life working on, on the tuna fisheries and how we were able to actually increase the economic benefits from the tuna resources. As you all know, the Pacific Islands are probably, Pacific Islands waters contribute about 60% of the global tuna supply. And if you take Indonesia and Philippines and include them, that's 80% of the world's global tuna supply. So it's a, it's a significant proportion of the tuna that's uh, taken from, from, from the world, uh, which is taken largely from the waters of the Pacific Island countries. I started my career very much negotiating um, in foreign affairs. I was involved in, in bilateral access negotiations. And I just wanted to share with you all that um, when we first started out, this is going back to the 1980s in 1988, uh, the rate of return from access agreements was around three to four percent. And we would just rely on what the Japanese would tell us that they were actually paying for the, for the fish that was being landed in, in Yaisu and other ports in Japan. I also remember that when the United States signed a five-year multilateral agreement with the Pacific Island countries for 12 million US dollars a year for 60 boats, 60 large Per sameness. There was so much excitement in the Pacific. And this was after they had been fishing illegally in, in the Pacific Island waters. Um, but those were the days in which the arrangements were largely loose. I mean, even though we had the Law of Sea Convention, um, it was largely open access. It wasn't, uh, you know, access wasn't, wasn't limited. And Therefore, developing the framework that we now have and the opportunities that we now have were not present at that time. So when I always, when I look back and reflect on, 
on how far we have come, I really think about how much we lost. And that is what, you know, it's, to me is, is, the, is the real tragedy. It's not how much we, have, we are making now, but how much we, we lost. Um, one of the things I always said when I was working as legal counsel to the Pacific Islands Foreign Fisheries Agency, which is the coordinating body to help support the Pacific Island countries was that I could see that we were exercising sovereign rights, but we were really exercising sovereign rights for the benefit of the fishing nations. So what did we actually do? And what, at, at the end of the day, I, it bothered me really that um, we were not getting the benefits that we could. And our leaders kept talking about um, how we, our aspiration is to develop our own tuna fisheries. And also it's to um, you know, own, own the fishery, but we were always, um, it was an aspiration that, that seemed to elude most of us until 2008. In 2008, I was sitting, uh, standing in between the head of Papua New Guinea fisheries and head of Marshall Islands fisheries. What had happened in the, 19, in the mid 1990s was that international fisheries had also changed as well. You had the UN Fish Stocks Agreement come in and the international community also realized that our resources were not, were not infinite. And so there was a change and shift in also the international uh, um, impetus around fisheries. And that also influenced the, the way in which the instruments uh, were designed in, in the Pacific Island countries. And one of the things that they developed was the, what's known as the Palau arrangement. And I'm glad uh, our meeting was, uh, our keynote speaker was the president of Palau because it's the Palau arrangement that set in place this framework that then allowed this grouping of countries in the Pacific to change the, the arrangement. Initially, it was, uh, they set up, a, it was a um, limit by the number of vessels, but that, that didn't work because the allocation was still given to fishing states. And in 2008 and 2009, I was tasked with the job of setting up an office in the Marshall Islands for the parties to the Nauru Agreement, it's called the PNA, and to commercialize. By then, the grouping of countries had developed what's now known as the Vessel Day Scheme, which is a, a cap and trade scheme, which is for the information of, of listeners, it's the largest tuna fisheries management arrangement in the world, and probably the most complex fisheries management arrangement also by scale and by size uh, in the world. So my task was to go in and set up this organization and also to commercialize the vessel day scheme. But importantly, I think for our discussions in blue economy is the fact that we were asked to go and set it up with no funding contribution from the governments so that it would be all self-funded. I, I was very apprehensive because all of this was going to be new. I did not know where we were going to get our revenue stream from. But I soon realized that, you know, you're dealing with international fisheries. It's the largest fishery in the world. And so we, we set up a we were able to extract some conservation levies to support the office. But then the most important thing that we did, the first thing we did and realized was that there has to be some scarcity. You have to create some scarcity. And therefore we, in the first year, we, we advised the, the membership of the arrangement that without this scarcity, without hard limits to the number of days, and just to, as to explain the, Vessel day scheme works as a cap and trade scheme. So each year there's an allocation of days, total number of days that are allocated to each parties that are then negotiated and sold to the Japanese, to the Americans, to the, um, to the European Union, um, to the Chinese and Taiwanese and Koreans who, lo who own most of the, most of the fisheries. I mean, initially there was a, a lot of, uh, uh, reluctance on their part, they were complaining. Um, but the biggest transformation in the arrangement was, was the fact that we 
it's designed the relationship between the and those that actually sudden we were not um, price takers but we were price setters and one of the one of the things that the the vessel day scheme um, created was a, a market an independent market for days independent of the price of, of fish now initially there was um, you know the gains it, it took some time for the gains to be realized, maybe about a couple of years for the scheme to, to start to set in. Um, but then when the party started to realize in, in, in 2012, um, the, the ministers agreed to set up a minimum benchmark price. Because what was happening was these fishing states and companies were playing off the countries against each other. They would go to Papua New Guinea and say, we're only paying um, Kiripasi uh, X, X amount of dollars for their days and they would uh, play off the countries against each other and they realized the countries realized what was going on and so they decided that they would then set a, a floor a minimum benchmark price that no one would go under but then leave it to the market and that transformed the fisheries from 2013 um, uh, initially, when, when we started off in 2010, uh, when I went to set up the office, the total value of the fishery to the Pacific Island countries was around 60 million US dollars. When I left six and a half years later, it was, I left with the value of the fishery, the value of the, this is the direct value that was coming back to the, to the treasuries. It was 470 million dollars. And that's just because of the, the nature of the, the instrument. And this is only one particular fishery. This is the skipjack surface fishery, which is what you find in the in canned tunas um, in Europe and in the USA. Um, we're not, we haven't reached that kind of success. I think the opportunity um, lies for us to do similar sort of arrangements for other tuna fisheries. Um, that are that are that fish on the high seas, but the less the key lesson that we have learned, and we, you know the message that we can take away from um, from the Persian vessel day cap and trade scheme is that it's doable, depending on the institutions that you set up, and in the Pacific Island countries, particularly the the, the grouping of smaller grouping of countries that I work with, called the parties to the Nauru Agreement. They went away and set it up themselves and were able to leverage the access to the exclusive economic zone. And that's probably a key factor as well in the development of blue economy, particularly around uh, improving fisheries outcomes. So the, the, the key lesson that I'd like us to be able to, I think the, the key message is that we, it's unfinished business in terms of the opportunities, that there are so many other things that can be done to help improve and adapt and support and enhance the, the system. Thanks, Martin. Thank you so much, Transform. That, that's, that's been really, really insightful. I mean, you highlighted the huge opportunities for tuna in the Pacific Islands, but then you also highlighted what, what changed, I mean, with the international fisheries. Uh, agreements, the emphasis changed in, in, in 2008, but then you highlighted, you know, what you did to, you know, to become price setters and, uh, you know, to set up this kind of independent market of, you know, independent of the price of fish. We're looking at the, you know, the cap and trading scheme, vessel day scheme um, developed by the, you know, the sub region grouping and the, um, you know, the parties to the Nauru agreement. So a, a lot of really exciting developments and case studies you highlighted there. Um, and you highlight the importance of the institutions that are set up. I just wanted to uh, add a couple of links in the in the chat for everyone and the kind of uh, work we have done at the World Ocean Initiative in terms of highlighting the importance of, of tuna fisheries, but also sustainable fisheries, 
uh, in in Pacific Islands as well. So have a look at um, have a look at that. But now let's let's go into the uh, Q and A. And thanks so much, everyone, for sending your great questions. Um, there was one question was what was a bit uh, uh, kind of about kind of almost like disillusionment in terms of you know what came out of you know COP twenty six has come and gone. Uh, there are now lots of distractions and so on. Um, with with we you know with, with with you know the global uh, geopolitical situation and so on. So I wanted to ask Jean Paul just just quickly and please keep your answers brief because we we only have thirteen minutes. Uh, given that you're very much involved in COP twenty seven now, I mean in in many ways COP twenty six it kind of confirmed that climate action is ocean action and and vice versa. I mean, what would constitute a good outcome from COP twenty seven in Egypt uh, to deliver on the promise of the blue economy, uh, Jean Paul? Thanks very much, Martin. Firstly, I think that there has to be a recognition that the, the a, a stronger recognition of the ocean as a climate regulator, uh, and therefore uh, the ability to protect the ocean has to be linked uh, to the outcomes of, of uh, COP27. And I see an opportunity in the upcoming uh, Convention on Bio Biological Diversity, COP15, where there is a goal to protect at least 30% of the, uh, of the world's uh, oceans to have them under some form of protection. And I think there has to be a link between that goal of, of protecting 30% of the world's ocean and, um, the, uh, and the goal of building climate resilience uh, through ocean protection. And I think that if these, uh, if these goals are pursued in a um, holistic manner, uh, they will actually also succeed in creating jobs uh, and in actually revitalizing a lot of these econo economies that have been uh, decimated by the COVID-19 pandemic and by uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine more recently. And we should not forget that ultimately climate change is the biggest cost to all economies. And in Africa, we've done work which has shown that it's actually currently uh, costing um, uh, close to 5% on average of GDP to African countries. And in some extremely climate vulnerable regions, this could be in excess of 15%. Um, if, you, if we have warming uh, in excess of four degrees, we hope we won't be in that line, but two degrees of warming, which is the current, uh, over two degrees of warming, which is the current track, um, means a loss of GDP of over 5% uh, in African countries. So building resilience through the ocean uh, is uh, about economic diversification for um, particularly for uh, island countries and for coastal countries. Uh, and about building resilience uh, in the process. And if we can link the outcomes of COP27 and, and uh, COP15 on biodiversity, uh, we can, I think, uh, get a new uh, sense of momentum and also investment uh, in the much needed uh, goal of increasing the amount of uh, ocean under protection to build climate resilience. Yeah, that makes sense, Joe Paul. I mean, you highlight how important it is to, to, to build that economic diversification. That, that opportunity uh, linking biodiversity action, climate action is, is real. So thanks for highlighting that. We have a question here uh, that is uh, directed at uh, Melissa. So this is from uh, Baker uh, Matovu, who is basically um, saying that, um, you know, they would like to know uh, if the ADB finances small coastal women projects to promote coastal uh, resilience. And if yes, how can we access such small grants? Melissa? Uh, thanks very much for the question. Because the Asian Development Bank, we, we are a development bank with um, owned by our members. So we do have some limitations on who we can fund. And while we do have a new um, SME incubator um, that can provide some support to um, um, the private sector, um, small enterprises who are looking at bankable ocean enterprises, um, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to provide small grants um, directly to the civil sector. That's just a limitation of being the bank. But I will say that we really prioritize um, you know, empowering women across our programs, but we do that more through our technical assistance work um, rather than providing direct grants. And also just um, through the ocean projects that we, um, that we do fund, that we make sure that there is, there's an element of, um, of gender equality and, and women's economic empowerment throughout. So I would say that's the better way that we can um, help in that arena. 
Okay, amazing. And I mean, it's there, there are several questions on this kind of, um, you know, uh, integration and diversity element. There's a question here from, from Barbados saying, how important is it to highlight the role of indigenous populations and indigenous marine practice when discussing SDG 14 and the blue economy? Maybe a transform, would you like to take this one, the, the role of indigenous population and indigenous marine practice? Uh, I, it is important. I think we realize now that um, in terms of the climate change impacts and resilience and all that, we realize that uh, traditional knowledge is our, our forefathers were able to deal with a lot of these issues. And so um, there's this uh, resurgence or renaissance of, of traditional knowledge and increasingly, um, particularly at the national uh, level, there is a um, growing need for integration of these traditional practices in, in various uh, um, responses. And so you're seeing that as emerging. So definitely, uh, even in the context of the uh, ABB, BBNJ process, there's a acknowledgement of the importance of uh, indigenous knowledge and contribution to, to the process. So definitely it is something that uh, that is being acknowledged and uh, you, you can see the, the emergence and the engagement in international plus particularly, but not more, more so in the national processes. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks a lot, uh, Transform. Just a, a quick question for you uh, as well, because directly, uh, uh, you know, directed to you from someone from Bahamas. Um, how can we better protect our oceans from illegal fishing and discourage uh, such such practices? Um, technology is actually improving so much. So you'd be amazed by the the, the level of, of, of advancement in satellite based and all, you know, all sorts of emerging technologies that now allow us to not just monitor, but we can we can you you can zoom in and know um, so it, that's i think integrating integrating your fisheries management and, and developing your um, compliance I think we're losing you there, Transform. Uh, but working with Propol, Fishwatch, and there are other groups, technologies that allow us now to, to better monitor based measures. Having market, strong market based measures are also very important. But I was just saying, Martin, that technology, technological development, and private mm -hmm. public sector partnerships in that space is important. Yeah, that makes sense. Technologies, private, um, public partnerships, uh, there are many opportunities to, to tackle this. Thank, thanks a lot for highlighting that. There are a couple of questions on MPAs, and I wonder, maybe Jean-Paul, you could take this, but an, anyone really. Um, so there's one from Jonathan uh, McHugh, and uh, he's interested to learn uh, that Palau considers you know, this legislation to reduce the area of marine protected areas as it had been uh, seen to be having a negative impact uh, on availability of fishery stocks. So in this kind of strategy, um, uh, is this kind of a strategy that, that other islands uh, have to consider? I mean, usually MPAs should result in positive impacts for fisheries within the nations. Uh, but is there kind of an underlying issue there uh, in terms of designing, uh, designing MPAs? Uh, and related to that, there was a question from Kiribati on the uh, MPA in um, you know, the, the, the PIPA, which I think re uh, refers to the Phoenix Islands. Uh, uh, a protected area which um, uh, has been fully closed, uh, had been fully closed to commercial fishing, but had to be reopening. So, so what's happening in the MPA space? Uh, uh, Jean Paul, could you give us some insight? Thanks, Martin. I think that's a really interesting question. I have to start by saying that I am not familiar with the specific example of Palau, but I will rather answer than by responding on my experience in, in another region and specifically in the Indian Ocean. Uh, based on my experience in, in Seychelles. Um, uh, you know, numerous uh, research has, has shown a very clear linkage between um, the effective implementation of marine protected areas 
and long-term benefits in terms of the health of, of fish stocks and the linkage as well with a more resilient uh, ecosystem. Uh, but uh, marine protected areas need to be very carefully designed. Uh, there needs to be a significant amount of, of study. Uh, there needs to be a good use of data. In the context of, of Seychelles, for example, when uh, we undertook the uh, marine spatial planning exercise as part of the creation of the marine protected area, which was done as part of the, the death swap. Uh, it, it involved using a, a large amount of, of data available, sometimes not available in Seychelles. I've been working with partners, uh, looking at uh, areas where there were uh, um, uh, mineral upwellings, for example, below the ocean floor, which were corresponding with high areas of biodiversity. It meant looking at all of those different uh, aspects very, very carefully to identify precisely what are the areas, first of all, that are a threat, what are the areas that are of high importance uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, for the biodiversity mass and for uh, reproduction in the, in the long term? Uh, and what are the actions that need to be take, taken? Keeping in mind as well, the traditional areas that have been accessed by different uh, fisheries groups, uh, those that are accessed by industrial uh, fishing groups and so on. And the decision has to be taken on the basis of science as to what will be the impact. Uh, uh, what will be the optimal uh, way of implementing a marine protected area. Mm -hmm. I think there has to be care taken that uh, you don't just have a marine protected area on paper. So it has to be able to be measured in terms of its impact. And that's a question which can only be defined uh, by, by science. So in the question of Palau, I'm not sure what uh, led to the, the changes, but certainly I think in terms of going forward, there needs to be that link between the science that is available uh, and the uh, the link that marine protected areas will have with the overall economic development. Yeah, that makes sense. Really important to highlight that link with, with the science and that they, there isn't just this protection on, on paper. And we're running out of time, but very briefly, Melissa, if you could, uh, within like one minute or less, uh, a question from Iceland, uh, from someone in Iceland who says they would like to know how the ADB categorized and priorit prioritized the growing request for the transformation of the world's food system in, in, you know, in light of the aquatic kind of food production across islands. So any insights on that? Yeah, well, I can just say that we are certainly looking into it. It's um, We mapped out the blue economy looking for where there were investment opportunities and definitely sustainable seafood value chains, including aquaculture and wild caught fisheries. You know, the, these were areas that just jumped off the map for us and said, this is where we need to be looking for bankable ocean investments. So we're doing some scoping studies right now to find areas that we can invest, but we're also trying to, uh, yeah, to better understand, I guess, where, where there's value added because it's um, quite a big, um, qu quite a lot of people working in this area, but we certainly think that it's a, it's a growing sector of the blue economy um, and a place to look forward in the future. Uh, lastly, on how do we know what to finance? We, we're not categorizing it, but we are using the United Nations Environment Program's finance initiatives. They have some principles um, based on sector by sector to guide financial institutions on what's eligible to be funded. And there's some really good guidance to be found there. So I, I would highly recommend that and ADB is following that guidance. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Amazing. Thanks so much, Melissa, for highlighting that. And we're covering uh, at the World Ocean Initiative as well how, um, you know, how these different frameworks are evolving. Um, and um, this is such an exciting space, of course, very, very much uh, about you know, creating the standards frameworks to make blue finance uh, sustainable and create more opportunities for innovative financing. So thanks a lot, uh, Melissa. Thanks a lot, Jean-Paul. Thanks a lot, Transform, for your great contributions. And thanks for all of your questions. Just by uh, way of uh, summarizing, you know, we, we learned from, from the president of Palau, you know, where there are threats, there are opportunities. Uh, there is lots of um, opportunity for innovative financing, uh, creating fresh partnerships. Uh, we heard about the Blue Prosperity Plan uh, and, and, and the great opportunity that brings, highlighting the need for, for good science, as Jean-Paul just mentioned again. Uh, and of course, building resilience through the blue economy, as, as, as Jean-Paul highlighted in his, um, in his uh, contribution, uh, highlighting the uh, importance of uh, you know, the blue economy as a framework, as an organizing principle for economic development, uh, the, you know, highlighting the, uh, the opportunities to sustainable fisheries, marine protected areas, uh, clean marine transport. Um, and of course, it's, it's important to, uh, to look at how we, we raise funds in a constrained uh, world and looking at kind of uh, 
debt for climate adaptation swaps, blue bonds, for example, voluntary credit markets. So we learned a lot about the opportunities that exist. And of course, uh, the ADB, as Melissa highlights, is, is doing a lot of great work in this space too, such as the blue bond incubator, the blue Pacific finance hub, for example. So lots of interesting developments there. And of course, Transform highlighted the uh, the importance of looking at you know tuna resource in the Pacific Islands, looking at how to manage uh, the world's largest tuna stocks. Um, you know, it's 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 really important to look at you know some of those kind of innovations there in terms of the cap and trading scheme, the vessel day scheme, and the um, you know the, the the Nauru agreement, and how to design um, institutions across regional boundaries to um, to sustainably manage fish stocks. And of course, um, there are lots of more opportunities to, to, to get involved. So I'd like to thank everyone for your great questions and for your great contributions. I've highlighted in the uh, in the link um, in the chat that if you want to find out more from the World Ocean Initiative, have a look at our website, ocean.economist.com. Uh, and of course, we have our own summit um, next year. And, and throughout this year, we have a lot of interesting uh, events, uh, for example, at the an ocean tech and innovation summit uh, later this year. We have the Asia Pacific World Ocean Summit and of course our flagship World Ocean Summit next year. So thanks a lot again, everyone, uh, and enjoy the rest of uh, the island finance forum.